Neuroscientific advances in the last 50 to 100 years, from biochemistry to animal models to imaging techniques to computer algorithms, shed light on fundamental reward processes. By understanding the intrinsic re-regulating mechanisms governing pain and pleasure, we can gain new insight into why and how too much pleasure leads to suffering. Let's start with dopamine. Dopamine is a brain neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters are like baseballs. The pitcher is the presynaptic neuron or brain cell. The catcher is the postsynaptic neuron. The catcher's mitt is the receptor. And the space between pitcher and catcher is the synaptic cleft. After the pitcher pitches the ball, the catcher catches it and the play is complete. In other words, neurons are separated by a small space that's bridged by neurotransmitters, which serve as a built-in control mechanism to regulate the electrical signals propagating throughout the brain. Dopamine is not the only neurotransmitter involved in reward processing, but most neuroscientists agree it is among the most important. A rat who lacks dopamine will not seek out food, even if food is placed just inches from its mouth. Indeed, it will starve to death. Yet if food is put directly into the rat's mouth, it will chew and eat the food, which is why so many scientists believe that dopamine plays a bigger role in motivation than reward, wanting more than liking. Today, dopamine functions as a kind of universal currency for neuroscientists to measure the addictive potential of any drug. The more dopamine a drug releases in the brain's reward pathway, a brain circuit that links the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, and the prefrontal cortex, and the faster it releases dopamine, the more addictive the drug. For a rat in a box, food increases the basal output of dopamine in the brain by 50 units, sex by 200, nicotine by 250, and cocaine by 350 units. Amphetamine, the active ingredient in the street drugs Speed, Ice, and Shabu, as well as medications like Adderall and Ritalin, used to treat attention deficit disorder, increases the release of dopamine by 1,200 units. In addition to the discovery of dopamine, one of the most remarkable findings in neuroscience in the past century is that the same regions of the brain involved in processing pleasure are also involved in processing pain. Pleasure and pain work like opposite sides of a balance. Imagine our brains contain a balance like a teeter-totter in a child's playground. When nothing is on the balance, it's level with the ground. When we do something pleasurable, dopamine is released in our reward pathway and the balance tips to the side of pleasure. The more our balance tips and the faster it tips, the more pleasure we feel. But here's the important thing about the balance. It wants to remain level. It does not want to be tipped for very long to one side or another. Hence, every time the balance tips toward pleasure, powerful homeostatic mechanisms kick into action to bring it level again. This does not require conscious thought or an act of will. It just happens, like a reflex. Once the balance is level, it doesn't stop there. Instead, it tips an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. I tend to imagine this as little gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance, playing there for a while, then hopping off to allow the balance to return to the level position. In the 1960s, social scientist Solomon Corbett called this reciprocal relationship between pleasure and pain the opponent process theory. Any prolonged or repeated departures from hedonic or affective neutrality have a cost. That cost is an after-reaction, which is opposite in value to the stimulus. Or as the old saying goes, what goes up must come down. This return to a level balance is called homeostasis. We've all experienced that moment of wanting a second piece of chocolate or wanting a good book, movie, or video game to last forever. That moment of wanting in its mildest form is the balance tipped to the side of pain. 